title of our message is The Seven Bold Judgments, Part Two. And today we are looking at the sixth bold judgment that is poured out. We're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through this book. And as we look at this sixth bowl, it contains in it what a term in which so many people have heard with their ears, but they might not fully understand. And that is, as the world is in crisis and when there's military endeavors going on and there's tensions around the world, there is a fear that runs through the hearts and souls of men and women around the planet, especially those who are kind of connected to biblical things and feel like there is end times. You see, throughout culture, there is a sense that sometime in the future, there will be an end of the world. And the Bible tells us that that is true that God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he is going to wrap things up after a time of great tribulation, seven-year period of time, and then a thousand-year reign of Christ, and then the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, according to Peter. But there's a term that gets thrown around when there's military tensions on this planet, and it's called the Battle of Armageddon. People have heard it. They have... They make movies entitled Armageddon. They have these, but usually it's connected out of its context to Armageddon is the end of the world. Now that is true in part that this battle takes place at the end of the greatest time of trouble on planet earth, the great tribulation period of time. But people that hear Armageddon usually don't know what it means. It is a battle, the battle of Armageddon. And the sixth bowl that the angel pours out brings a consummation or a togetherness about the nations of the planet in their military power and might to one location, get this, to actually fight against the God of the universe. Now, is that funny or what? Military generals, world leaders. Now, I I believe that there's a different deception that's underlying things that get them to this location. But ultimately, when we see the biblical prophecies about it, it is the devil that is orchestrating it to get these military leaders to basically make his last stand to try to fight against God. Now, I mean, men with their firecrackers trying to deal with the God of the universe. I like what Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage and why do they plot a vain thing? Why do they rage against the Lord and against his Christ, his his son. It says, the Lord shall laugh from heaven when this takes place. Justin Stevens, who has been our youth pastor for about four years, and I think uh, this next month he'll have been here about five years, but he has gone out and he's starting a fellowship over in Star Valley. They have about 20 people that he's been teaching for six months on Saturday nights. And that's going to turn into a Uh, Sunday morning, actually next Sunday morning, Lord willing, it looks like they're going to have a church, a Calvary Chapel in Star Valley with Pastor Justin. So it's pretty exciting. And, uh, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, starting to reach out. And so Justin's doing that. But while Justin was with us, he, he got in a rhythm for a while where he was teaching at the juvenile detention center here. We call it three 3B Detention Center. And he was teaching once a month there and the staff kind of liked him and Justin's a real down-to-earth guy and comes in and shares the love of God. And, and so he was sharing with me and, and for you who don't know Justin, Justin's 6'3 and about 220, 240 pounds. Justin's a big boy. And so he said he was teaching there one day and this was after the fact. He came and told me about the Bible study of the day. And he was teaching and there, you know, there's, there's wannabe tough guys and, and, and juvie. And so some of the things that Justin said really made this guy mad that was on the front row. So he was getting all huffy, acting like he was going to take Justin on. And, and everybody was kind of looking at this and Justin, 6'3", 320, looked at him and said, what are you going to do, cupcake? (laughs) It just mellowed everything, just diffused everything. (laughs) Reminds me of that cartoon. Uh, You're a chicken and I'm a chicken hawk, you know, type of thing. And and here is the nations of the world coming together for a battle against the Lord and against his Christ. And the Lord is going to laugh in the heavens. 
And so let's look at all the components that the sixth angel, as he pours out his bowl of judgment, what takes place. It says in verse 12, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Skip one verse. We're going to come back to it. Go to verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew... Armageddon. Armageddon is the geographical location of the greatest battle on planet earth at the end of the great tribulation. All of these kings that gather there in this geographical location, Armageddon is Har Megiddo. It means the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo is a real city, an ancient city. It's a ruins or what they call it in Israel, a tell, T-E-L. Tell means old. And because of Israel's ancient civilization, it, when a town was destroyed, then they had built another one on it. And then that town was destroyed, then they had built another one on it. Then that town was destroyed, then they had built another one. And then that town, and many of them have, you know, 10, 20, 30 times just stacked up of rebuilding and rebuilding. And... Megiddo is that way. Megiddo is this tell. It is this mount. It is this high spot that as you stand there, which I have stood there at the valley or Har Megiddo on the Mount of Megiddo and looked at this incredible valley. It's also called the Valley of Je- the Jezreel Valley. And, and a number of biblical wars took place there. And when Napoleon Bonaparte came along and he saw this valley, he said, this is the greatest battlefield I have ever seen. It is perfect. It's this wide open, very gradual sloping battlefield. And 60 miles north of Jerusalem is the Mount of Megiddo. It is the place that at the end of the Great Tribulation, at the end of the seven years, as the Antichrist, as we see, and the, who is a political leader, and the devil, that there is this incredible satanic draw, a spiritual warfare that brings them to this place to fight against the Lord and his Christ. Now, it's not really much of a battle when you're reading Revelation chapter 19. Jesus opens his mouth, wipes them all out. That's all over. That's it. But... So, uh, you know, people are all amped up about it. And the Lord just, just destroys them with the sword, his word that comes out of his mouth. But let's look at the components that kind of put this whole scenario together. First of all, in chapter 16, verse 12, it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and it was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. The great river Euphrates, a natural land barrier, it is a great river. It starts in the southeastern mountains of Turkey. It comes from Turkey, it goes into Syria, and then it goes the full length of the country of Iraq. It and another great river, the Tigris River, run almost parallel all the way to the end of Iraq, and then they come together for a short little period before they go into the Persian Gulf. The great river Euphrates in its immensity, it's 1,728 miles long. It's extremely wide and it is this, the mountains in southeastern Turkey is an incredible watershed. It is also what is known as the cradle of civilization because these two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, but in the Hebrew it's called the Hittichel, along with two other rivers, the Pishon and the Gihon, are the four rivers in Genesis chapter 2 that are the headwaters of these four rivers come out of the Garden of Eden. And so at the very cradle of his civilization where Adam and Eve began and where people began to populate was right here in this area as we know, is quite arid today in the Middle East and dry and barren, but it wasn't at one time. And it's fascinating that it is here that is really a central passageway for the masses of humanity to travel to the place of Megiddo or this place of battle. 
When you think of John the Apostle getting this vision on the island of Patmos 2,000 years ago, the thought of the great river Euphrates drying up had to be the most outlandish, outrageous human thought anybody that had seen the river. Massive river. But today, if you Google the Euphrates River, you'll find out that the issues surrounding the Euphrates River alone, many think, will be the next great battle in the Middle East. There are those who are experts in political uh, tensions and various things that say the next extreme battle in the Middle East is not going to be over religion, and it is not going to be over oil. It is going to be over water because of the dry aridness that, you know, the massive populations need this water. And so uh, you think about it because Turkey came up with an extremely aggressive plan just in the country of Turkey. Remember, it goes from Turkey to Syria and then down to Iraq. In Turkey alone, they are going to build 22 massive dams, 19 hydropower plants, and then it gets to Syria, if there's any water left, to Syria, and that's where the... the the Euphrates Dam is, which is the largest earth and dam on the planet. And uh, there's tensions with the Turkish people because they want to use all the water. Then when it gets to Syria, that they use all the water. And then the Iraqis have seven dams on the Euphrates River. And even as we speak at certain seasons in Iraq now, there are times when there is hardly a trickle that actually makes it to the Persian Gulf because of the water that is used. 2,000 years ago, the thought of the great Euphrates, Euphrates, that that river, (laughs) drying up would have blown everybody's mind. But today, the first great dam that was built on it was the Euphrates Dam in Syria in 1973. Folks, in the last 35 years, the last 40 years, we have seen the capacity to dry up the Euphrates River like this planet has never seen. You see, all the components that we mention them one by one and sometimes randomly and disconnected, we are in a time of the end times. The Lord is coming again. And so this seems to be, though, supernatural. It's not dams, because right now there, there has been terrorism and bombings of dams because of the guys that are trying to, the countries that are uh, basically in a water war, if you will. And that, those tensions that are taking place, now this angel comes, pours out his bowl of wrath. It's supernatural, it's angelic in nature, and it's God's plan that these rivers be dried up for a purpose. And that is now to make, it says at the end of verse 12, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So these kings from the east are going to come from the east. And just to give you a little Bible insight, that any time the Bible says, from the east or from the west or the north or south, what is the the central pivot point of those directions? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in God's magnetic compass, his spiritual compass, if you will. That is magnetic north, if you will. It is the center of the planet. It is the center of the universe, if you will. And it's what's hilarious when you go to Israel and you drive around, it's only 300 miles long and 50 miles wide. I mean, it's really this dinky little country. It's basically like the Snake River Plain from Idaho Falls to Boise. That's it. That, that's all of Israel. And yet, when the Euphrates is dried up, that means its parallel uh, river, the Tigris, also has to be dried up because it's a natural land barrier from the kings of the east. If you go and draw a straight line east from Israel, even more specific, Jerusalem, where do you end up? You end up in Asia, China, and all the various Asian people, India, where one out of every four people on the planet is from. It is the massive population of our planet. It's no wonder we don't have a little wobble on the earth because there's so many people there when it spins around. India has 1.1 billion people. China has 1.3 billion people. But India is going to surpass China in the year 2050. They're going to have like, you know, 1.5 or 6 billion people. Why? Because in India, there is absolutely no birth control. Just they're having babies like crazy. But in China, they passed a law that you can only have one baby. Now, this creates a tension as well, right? 
And it also, I mean, can anybody see a, just a, you know, a perspective problem with this? And that is the Chinese who are into ancestry worship, they want their family name to go along. I think every culture wants their family name to continue on, right? But in China, if you can only have one kid, they all want boys, right? So that's a problem. Right now, there is 100 girls for every 118 boys. By then, in, by 2020, one article I read, it will be 100 girls to every 138 boys. So why are the kings of the East going to come to Israel? They're frustrated bachelors in search of women. No, that's not it. <laughs> I've known some frustrated bachelors. They're ready to go to war. Never mind. We don't know all of the dynamics that go into that, but what we know is geographically, the kings of the east are going to head towards where? The Valley of Megiddo, and they're going to head there via the dried up Euphrates River and the Tigris River and the waterways to get there. Back in the 60s, China, having the you know, largest population of the earth, declared that within three months from the time that they give the word, within three months, they could muster a 200 million man militia. Think about that. There's only 290 million in America. 200, and 200 million man army from China. They said that back in the, in the 60s. So they obviously have the capacity for great... Uh, a great military force. So the kings of the East are going to come. They're going to come via the Euphrates River. But what is behind it? Who could stir up the kings from the East to come West, if you will? The devil himself. It is spiritual in nature. You know, Paul the Apostle told us so articulately and specifically in Ephesians chapter 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? principalities, powers, and rulers. Do you know that those three words, those three Greek words, are ranks of demonic forces? Powers, principalities, powers, rulers, generals, colonels, captains. And it appears that there are, there are demons that are over specific, as we see in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, that the angel Gabriel, the angel was, or an, an, a messenger was coming, and Michael, the archangel, delivered him from the prince of Persia. It was a demonic force that was over the entire Persian government. In reality, when I say, man, the devil's really tempted me, I've never had in a direct interaction with the devil. Because he lives, you know, I, I don't get a general, I don't get a captain, I don't get a lieutenant, I get a buck private that, you know, has lost his job several times, kind of thing. I'm way down on the food chain as far as conflict goes. But there are greater principalities, and look at what happens in verse 13 and 14. It says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, unclean spirits are demons, coming out of the mouth of the dragon. The dragon's the devil. Coming out of the mouth of the beast. That's a political leader. We know him as the Antichrist. Coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's his right-hand man, his kind of spiritual advisor. And then verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then we find out in verse 16 that it's to Armageddon, right? So the devil sends out this demonic spirit. The devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are known to commentators as the unholy trinity. You and I worship the Father, serve the Son, enjoy the power of his spirit in all of those things, the holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here is the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And out of their mouth comes these demonic creatures that influence the leaders of the world. 
kings and presidents and generals and tensions begin to rise. And they think it's just what they're thinking about. But there's, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. There's a demonic force whispering in the ears of these leaders. What are these? It says these demons look like frogs. Maybe we should say, what are they croaking in the ears of these leaders? Instead of ribbit, they're croaking, Maggetto, Maggetto, Maggetto. They're somehow bringing an influence that stirs them up to focus. I mean, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Focus on this little bitty postage stamp of a country called Israel. Do we see what we would call the beginning birth pains for these last hundred years since Israel's become a nation of a world's focus on Israel? Yeah. President Obama, just a couple of months ago, his foreign policy agenda is what for Israel? He told the Israelis that they need to give up Jerusalem. You see, a real snare to every president in the past, a foreign policy nightmare is peace in Jerusalem, right? Peace in Israel. Because you have the Hamas, you have the Hezbollah, you have the PLO, Used to, you know, the kind of the face of all that used to be a guy by the name of Arafat, or it could be Ararat. Uh, and this individual and these people that are occupying Israel, people that are uneducated in biblical things, believe the answer is to try to give land to these people so there will be peace. Land for peace, that's the policy. It never works. Why? Because the Hamas, the Hezbollah, the PLO, the Palestinians will never, ever, 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 ever on this planet be satisfied with the land. They will not be satisfied till they annihilate the Jewish people and drive them into the sea. That's their plan. There's a prejudice, there's a hatred towards the Jewish people that you could give them, you could give them half of Israel and, and you're not going to stop the tensions. Now they're just closer to launch their little Scud missiles and their uh, rocket launchers and those kinds of things. So President Bush, I mean, President Obama is applying pressure to Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, to give up Jerusalem. And he came out. I was, I was quite proud of the Israeli leadership. They said, we will never, never come up to Jerusalem, you know. And Abinajab over in Iran said, as soon as they get the nuclear weapon, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to bomb Israel. As soon as they get a nuclear weapon... They're going to bomb Israel. But Israel has said, when they get close, we will not let them get that close. (laughs) They think we have the weapon. They think we have nuclear weapon. And the reporter said, do you have nuclear capabilities to Israel? He said, I did not say we do, but they think we do. (laughs) That means they do. (laughs) And the thing is, is that it's really important to understand in times wrapped in the prophetic time clock of Israel. If you don't understand it, you're going to get a little confused. So these demonic spirits go out and they inspire, well, they influence leaders. And it says even with signs, that means like signs and wonders and supernatural things. Are they seeing demons in their sleep? Are they having dreams? Are, they, are, are there things being proven by signs and wonders, if you will, by the demonic? Can, can, can demons... Do the supernatural? Can the devil? Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't long ago that I was talking to somebody in our church and they were talking to me about the occult and this and that and I, as I was sharing with them. And they said, yeah, but, you know, I was at the seance and we, we really saw something. It was, it was real. And I said, yeah, so? Well, I always hear you people at the church and you're, you're saying... That it's not real. I said, oh, you've never heard me ever say it's not real. I said, it's real. It's just from Satan himself. There is a power. There is an influence. That's why signs and wonders alone, not backed with the truth of Scripture, is dangerous because you can be deceived. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle said, if the devil himself can appear as an angel of light, is it any wonder that he can make his ministers ministers of righteousness? 
right? I mean, he, he's, a, he's a counterfeit. He's a deceiver. So you got to know the truth. But they're not looking for the truth. And I believe, by and large, our leaders in the world, the people around that council at the UN, I, I don't know how many of them would be believers, but I imagine they would be pretty easy to be influenced if the devil sends these demon forces out to influence them, even with signs and wonders. So, all the worlds gathered together. They're all coming together to this place called Armageddon. As I said, it's not much of a battle. This week, encourage you, read chapter 19. The Lord opens his mouth, wipes them all out, no big deal. As a matter of fact, then he, you know, the angel calls for the birds, buzzards, eagles, everything. All uh, birds that eat flesh, calls them all there to the valley of Megiddo, basically to eat them all up. You know, let's clean up this mess. You birds come and wipe them out. So, the verse we skipped over, though, I want to... You know, take care of here at the end of our time on this Sunday morning. For it says, and it seems to be dropped in here as a word of exhortation for the church, for God's people, for all generations. And it says in verse 15, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In the midst of all this chaos about the talk of the battle of Armageddon, is an exhortation of love from the Lord to you and I, to past generations, and if the Lord should tarry to future generations, and to those who are in that time of great tribulation. And that is, behold, I am coming as a thief. Jesus has promised that he, and he mentions this a couple of times in his own ministry, and then Paul the Apostle talks about it in Ephesians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But the Lord says, you know what, I'm going to come suddenly. And why would the Lord use the illustration of as a thief? Because a thief strikes by sudden surprise when nobody thinks he's going to come. Correct? I mean, have you ever had a thief call and make an appointment with you? Hey, you know, I'm going to burglarize your house tonight at three in the morning. It'd be nice if you just left, you know, save us both some trouble, leave the door open. Oh, put it in the day planner. Thieves come. No, they show up by sudden surprise, Right? You're blown away. You go, wow, I I didn't even think about it. I didn't lock my car. They got in, or I should have put that away, or I meant to take that to the safety deposit box, or whatever. And you're 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 struck with this reality that the Lord, boom, he just he just shows up like a thief in the night. And the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night in the rapture of the church. Now, we know at the second coming of Jesus, from the time that the treaty is signed, according to Daniel chapter nine, just to give you a very fast prophetic footnote, if you will, from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that the Antichrist is going to sign a peace treaty, the political leader is going to sign a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. At the middle of these seven years, three and a half years in, he's going to break that peace treaty. But right at the end of that seven years, the second coming, Jesus is going to come back. From the time that treaty is signed, we know, and and that, that, that the halfway mark, that he's going to come, that it's 42 months, it's 1,260 days. At the end of that seven-year period, that is a thing that, that from the time that peace treaty is signed, that is a definite thing. Those who are in the great tribulation will know when the second coming of the Lord is. But the rapture is something where the Lord just shows up. It could be at night. It could be at the day. Well, I guess it'll be night somewhere on the planet, right? People say, <laughs> well, I know what time the Lord's coming. So really, what time? Three o'clock in the morning. So really, how'd you know that? Well, it's going to be three o'clock in the morning somewhere on the planet, right? 24 hours. Kind of a little joke. And yet, some of you are so slow, but <laughs> somewhere on the planet, it's got to be three in the morning somewhere, right? But the reality is, is that the Lord's going to come at a time that nobody is expecting to take his people home, that there's going to be the the shout of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and those who are alive and remain, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, and those who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to be with the Lord and to be with him forevermore. It is a catching up of God's people, the rapture of the church, that I believe happens right before that seven years of great tribulation. Now, at this reality, the exhortation that's dropped right in the middle of this seven-bowl judgment is behold, I'm coming like a thief. Are you ready? That is the thought. If you thought a thief was coming today, 
You would go home, you would put away your valuables, you'd lock your door, you would, I mean, you, would, you would get ready for that thief. You might even be armed and dangerous when the thief shows up, right? But what if the Lord was going to come today? Do any of us here today honestly think he's going to come today? I mean, honestly. Not really. It's going to be another day, Sunday, after church, I'm going to go home, have lunch with my wife, and I'm going to take a nap. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up, go for a bike ride probably with my wife. We're just I mean, do you really think the Lord's going to come today? Now, I believe he can come today. I want him to come today. I'm excited about when he comes, but do you really think he's going to come? And, and I have to honestly answer that question and say, I hope he would come today, but honestly, I don't think he will come today. And so what does that mean? That means today is a great day for him to come, right? Because you don't expect it. Just like a thief shows up, you don't expect it. And so the Lord's going to come at such a time that, man, it just, wow, just blows us away. Now, if you really thought the Lord was going to come today, how would you live today? How would you live the rest of this day? Now, some of you have been struggling with sin every time you get outside these doors. So you say, could you lock me inside? Is he going to come today? Could you lock up the doors? And I just stand, I'm going to hold somebody's hand and sing Kumbaya until Jesus comes and gets me. Because every time I get out the doors of church, I get myself into trouble. You know, there's... I mean, if you really thought he was going to come today, it affects your behavior. That's why this exhortation is here. It affects your behavior. John the Apostle said this in 1 John. He said, those who have this hope of the Lord's coming purify themselves. Now, he says two things. He says it's going to be sudden, unexpected. That could happen any time because we don't expect it. Number two, he says, blessed or happy is he who watches that means there's a spiritual alertness. I believe that I am in that watching spiritual alert place because I want him to come. I'm ready for him to come. I hope he comes. That's being watchful. There are those who over the years have given me a hard time when we teach through prophecy, like a book of Revelation. There are even pastors that say, you know, you don't, the church doesn't need the book of Revelation. You shouldn't teach the church a book of or that. It, it's all about prophecy. And what they need to know is practical things. I mean, it doesn't get any practical, more practical than being right with Jesus. Amen. There's nothing more practical than that. But there's a big segment of the church that is not watching for his return. They don't even think about his return. They don't even think about it. When you talk about Jesus coming back again, and they're like, what? They don't even think about it. You know, these guys were out on a fishing trip, a commercial fishing boat. They'd go out for three or four weeks at a time, and they would come back. And there was a date given when they were going to come back. And, and, and so this fishing boat was coming in, and all the hired hands, you know, they've been there three or four weeks. They're, uh, they had this specific date. They're, they've missed their wife and their kids. They're excited. And guys are on the, got their binoculars. Oh, I see my wife. I see my kids. And, and there they are on the dock. And they're there. And as soon as they pulled in, they got out of the boat. And uh, families are hugging each other. And there's one, this one fisherman, and, and his wife's not there. He looks a little, she's not there. He walks up the hill. Their house is not far from the docks and the wharf down there. And, and so he walks up the hill and he opens the front door and there his wife is messing around in the kitchen. And he says, uh, hey. She goes, oh, hi, you're home. He goes, yeah. She said, why do you look bummed out? And he said, well, you know, I'm a, little, I'm a little disappointed that you weren't down there to meet me. And she said, well, I knew, I knew the date you were going to be here. I just, you know, I didn't. I figured, you just, you know, you'll be home. She said, why are you so bummed out about that? He said, well, I'm the only guy that his wife wasn't down there watching for him. You were waiting for me, but you weren't watching for me. It's the same thing with the church. You know, there's a lot of people that, oh, yeah, I think some, I heard something about Jesus coming, but we're not really watching for him. We're not really longing for him to come. We're, there's, there's this big disparaging point between who we are today in our love for the Lord. And sometimes our, we get our eyes on other things. It's usually young teenagers that come up to me after service like this, and they'll say something like this to me over the years. Pastor, I know you're talking about Jesus coming in the rapture, and that sounds all exciting, but I just got to confess, I don't really want him to come. I said, really? Why not? Maybe a young 16-year-old girl. She says, well, I was hoping just to, you know, have the experience of, of you know, get married before Jesus comes. I said, oh, baby, I promise you, you want him to come. (laughs) 
Or somebody that's married, they come up to me and say, man, pastor, I was so, you know, you said the Lord's going to come and I was, I'm kind of torn because I'm excited about him coming, but you know, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you think you're waiting for without the Lord's coming? Well, you know, I was hoping to have kids and, you know, see if they look like me. And they say, oh, I promise you, you want Jesus to come. Now, do I say that because I'm down on marriage or kids? No, I am a guy that's head over heels in love with my wife. And I love my kids and I'm so proud of them. They're awesome kids. But when you put sinners together and try to get along for a lifetime, that's a challenge, isn't it? I know you guys have never had struggles or challenges because you're great, godly people and perfect. But, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, some of you have teenagers. You're praying Jesus comes back this week <laughs> before you go to prison for murder. <laughs> you're going to have a jail ministry, you know. <laughs> and the reality is that sometimes there's... there's something you put there in that place. You, you would rather have this than the Lord's return. And so it diminishes your desire to watch and to pray and to wait for him. I don't mean wait, like sit around on your porch and sing Kumbaya. I mean that you're just this active thing. If this week, if the Lord is going to come anytime this week, I wouldn't change anything about my habits, my life. I'd just get up and do the same thing because I'm ready for him to come. I want him to come. I long for him to come. But if you're living in open sin, I bet you'd be praying for him not to come this week. It says, the third thought is there, number one is that there's an unexpected suddenness by which the Lord is going to come. Number two is, is that he wants us to be watching for him to come or a longing for his coming. And number three is, and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The thought of keeping your garments and being covered up so you're not naked and ashamed is a picture of being in moral sin. And, and there's nothing that would be more embarrassing than to be, you know, caught naked like Adam and Eve in the garden. What they do when they thought the Lord was going to come and they had, li- they, they had sinned, what they do? They hid themselves from God. Because when we sin, we want to hide from God, right? And when people stumble and fall and get into sin, if they don't repent, get reconciled and right with God, what happens? They stop coming to church. They stop reading their Bibles. They stop having, seeing Christians. They want to get away from them. Why? Because they're hiding from God. They're hiding from people that remind them of God. They want to get away from God because they're in sin. You know what I mean? They're, they're having sex with their boyfriend or they're having sex with their girlfriend. They're not married. They're, they're kind of shocked up or they're getting drunk or they're smoking dope or they're stealing from the company or they're doing this or that or they're locked into some secret sin nobody knows about. And when you talk to them about God or coming to church or you wonder why they've fallen out of fellowship, it's usually because some sin has got a stranglehold on them and they can't get free. Now, whoever the son sets free is free indeed. And all of us stumble and all of us fall But the thing is, is that we just want to reconcile with the Lord. Repent, enjoy the blood that has been shed for your sins, and get right with the Lord. You don't have to be out there lost and desperate and and living in, you know, a life of sin all the time. God can give you victory if you want it. Do you want the Lord Jesus to come and to catch you? It says, lest they see his shame embarrassed. Now, I believe that the Lord's going to come, and there's going to be a lot of folks that are watching for him, and it's going to be so exciting, but I think that there's a lot of believers that the Lord is going to come for, and the Lord is still going to take in the rapture, but they're going to be a little embarrassed about it. It says they're going to see his shame. Because the reality is, is that Jesus is not coming back, folks, to this planet to get a perfect church, or he would never come back at all. He's coming back to get sinners saved by his grace that love him and want to walk with him, though we stumble and though we fall. That's why it's kind of crazy to me, the whole doctrine of the kingdom now theology that says Christianity should take over politics so that we can Christianize the world and then Jesus is going to come back again. I mean, if the Lord's waiting for that, folks, we're sunk. We're here forever. But he's going to come back for his bride. And he doesn't want to catch us ashamed in sin. You know, he wants us to be loving him and walking with him. And when we do stumble and fall in sin, we repent and we get cleansed. I got to share with you how excited I am just at the end of this message about the the parade yesterday. And maybe you saw the front page of uh, today's newspaper 
with our float that's on front page. Yeah. For our VBS and, and, and the gang, what an what a awesome float. And everybody that helped, we just want to say thank you for uh, everybody that helped and chipped in. But I was thinking, you see the verse on there. The verse on there is Isaiah 45.20. And, and it's not only on there, but there was a speaker with a loop and, and, and it going on and on with, with Chalmers' voice. And this is what it's saying all the way down the parade route. Look to me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Look to me and be saved and all the ends, and it's all the way down. The, the, I just say, yeah! <laughs> Woo! And can I tell you folks, when the Lord comes, don't you think this is how, it, how he wants to find us? that all of our lives is on parade and what the testimony of our life is saying is look to the Lord, all ye ends of the earth, and he'll save your soul. He'll forgive your sins. Jesus died for you. And it's the hope that, you know, why do we want to reach 500 kids instead of 300 kids from last year for VBS? Because the only thing, folks, on this planet that is eternal is people. It's people. And they're lost in their sins and dying and going to hell without a savior. And unless we believe that and know it and it becomes a passion of our life, we simply don't care. We simply don't care. And the Lord says when he comes, he's going to come like a thief. Man, it's sudden, expected. We're not, I mean, we're not going to even expect it when he comes. He wants us to be watching for him, watching for that, that his incredible coming for his bride, his church. And he doesn't want to catch us in a lifestyle of sin. You know, as we wrap up here today, some of you might be here and you know what, you, you've been struggling with the Lord and if the Lord came today, folks, you'd be embarrassed. You'd be embarrassed about what you've let yourself get into. And today you want to get it right. This is a beautiful thing. The Lord doesn't just say, hey, you sinners, I'm all done with you. He says, no, just, just turn. That's what repentance is, changing your mind, changing your direction. And today you can be cleansed and you can be empowered and you can be set free. You can be delivered from the bondage of your sin and enjoy the goodness of the Lord. So you're excited about him coming this week. And live in such a way that every day of the week, you know what, I'm excited about Jesus coming because I'm right with him. And yeah, I stumbled and fell yesterday, but I repented. I got right. Man, I'm clean, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm ready. I'm ready for him to come. And so that we would live like that. And our life is on parade so that other people say, you know what, what you have, the meaning and the purpose in your life, I need that. The love, joy, and peace in your life, that's what I need. The sense of forgiveness, that's what I need. I need that. I need it. And all of us need it. And I just want you to know, as we wrap it up here today, I'm, I'm not sharing these things with you because I think I got it all together. I'm just one beggar showing other beggars where the bread is. I'm just one person that has experienced the grace of God and his forgiveness. And I want to share that same joyful experience of forgiveness and grace with everybody I meet. I pray you do too.